All right, I guess we can get started. Um, I think most of the folks are still in the other GPIO talk. Um, it was originally 20 minutes for each of our sessions, but somehow uh, Bartas' uh, talk was extended. So anyway, let's get started. So today we'll talk about pin control and uh, GPIO and their interactions and some of the foot guns that uh, exist in the system. So um, the opinions are my own, my own observations. And we'll talk about why this talk, uh, why I decided to give this talk, and quick intro into the uh, GPL and pin control subsystems, how the hardware is normally implemented, um, how the subsystems and user space interacts, and where uh, some drivers um, implement them incorrectly, and maybe some suggestions going forward. So um, some time ago, the pin control subsystem had introduced this thing called strict mode, and it's a pin mux feature. And what it does is basically interlocks your GPIO usage versus other pin control usage. And only a few uh, platforms actually adopted this, and most other platforms simply use uh, the pin control nodes in the device tree, um, specifying GPIO functions to um, prevent those pins from being allocated to other uses. And also, I've seen that in some, on some platforms, the drivers um, give incorrect um, pin config feedback, uh, readbacks in debugfs, or their uh, pin config options don't really align with what the definitions are. And I've spent some time trying to understand what the input and output pin config options really are supposed to do uh, versus what the implementations do. And there was a long thread on the uh, email mailing list talking about this. And last, there's the uh, user space GPIO foot gun in which you can out request a GPIO pin from user space, and that basically overrides your pin control usage, and suddenly one of your peripherals doesn't work. So the GPIO subsystem provides a common interface to control GPIO pins. You can drive a line uh, as output and set it to electrical high or low. You can read the line uh, status as input. And on some pins where the hardware supports it, you can use it as an interrupt. And either your hardware supports open drain or sor open source modes, or the core can emulate this for you. And in GPIO usage, you can also configure basic like biasing pull up, pull downs. And the whole subsystem core ensures that only one user of each uh, pin, uh, only each pin has only one user using it as a GPIO. So you can't really um, share a GPIO line. The only uh, the only exception to this is the fixed regulator stuff, which uh, in hardware commonly shares uh, the same GPIO line for like different reg regulators and. The API is really not easy to use and really shouldn't be used uh, be, be, be beyond this. Now, the pin control subsystem, uh, there's two parts to this. There's a pin mux, um, which basically lets you select um, what function you want to use on this pin. And it also maintains uh, exclusive usage for each pin, so you can't have two drivers requesting the same pin. And the other one is pin config, which basically lets you set um, electrical characteristics on each pin, such as biasing or the drive strength for your output signals, or there's also input enable, output enable, which is supposed to like enable buffers within the hardware, but those two things are loosely defined. We'll talk about this later. And there's also pin config output, which lets you set the electrical level on, on a pin, which kind of conflicts with GPIO, and we'll talk about this later again. Now, in hardware, GPIOs, or uh, general purpose IOs, 
or programmable I.O. pins. It depends on like if you're talking to a software person or a hardware person, to a hardware person, any pin that is configurable, configurable is a GPIO, even though you can't really, even if you can't really drive it high or low, you can just select functions. To them, it's still programmable. But to us, to be a GPIO, um, you have to be able to configure the pin as high or low. Um, so the hardware implements what we call GPIO and also the pin control stuff. And in some designs, the GPIO function driving a, a line high or low or reading back the, the line is always active. You can always um, force a line to high or low or just read back even though the line is being used by something else. And in other hardware, the GPIO function is a muxed in function, i.e. you select it to be in the GPIO mode and that kind of conflicts with using it for anything else. And depending on your hardware, um, some cases might not actually work with your hardware. So in the kernel, these two um, subsystems, pin control and GPIO, are um, kind of intertwined together. Most hardware have GPIO, um, have the pin programmable I.O. controllers, and you implement them as pin control controllers. And on top of that, you use the GPIO lib to um, also provide a GPIO interface. And that kind of interaction provides um, support for all kinds of different hardware. And depending on how you use the device tree and how the drivers are using it, it's possible to leave the hardware in an inconsistent state. For example, uh, when you release a GPIO pin, um, normally the pin is left in whatever state the driver was last using it. Um, but it's not guaranteed. Um, Bartos' talk is actually about GPIO persistence, and without something to actually keep it persistent, the state is really like driver dependent. Now, in PinMux and GPIO, the exclusivi exclusivity um, of the pin is separately controlled. So if you request a pin in PinMux, that only guarantees that another user can't request it in PinMux. However, <clears throat> they can request the pin as a GPIO unless the strict field in the uh, PinMux ops is set. That guarantees the, um, that both subsystems are sharing pins and they are looking, after, uh, looking out for each other and not stepping on each other. <clears throat> now, um, in the case of GPIO stepping over pin control, and normally it's because that the GPIO function is a muxed in function and it's not always on. And what you can get is like driver A requests a set of pins for like MMC and it's using it. And then driver B or user space requests one of those pins, say the MMC clock pin and overrides the muxing. And so now your MMC doesn't work because the, the clock signal is getting um, stolen away. <clears throat> now that happens either when you have an incorrect um, GPIO number in your device tree or your user space um, randomly requests GPIO pins. Um, in the case of device trees, you can kind of um, prevent this by locking the ping, uh, GPIO pin usage with pin control uh, entries, but that doesn't really save you from the user space case because, <clears throat> sorry, <coughs> because that doesn't really have a pin mux tied to it. Um, so with pin config and pin mux, um, we had these options called pin config output and pin config output enable. And on some platforms, it's implemented as mux to GPIO and set direction to output and then set a certain value. Um, so that kind of overrides the original pin mux setting again. And it's also not in the pin mux thing. 
Um, on Rocktrip, um, it's only used for GPIO pin muxes, and so the muxing is kind of redundant. Um, it, you, are, you are already requesting the GPIO and also setting the pin control um, settings. And on some other platforms, um, it's implemented as set direction to output and set value, but it's not muxing. So if you just set pin config output or pin config output enable, it sets the GPIO function, but you're not actually muxing in the GPIO function. So it really does nothing. And when you read back, you, you can see that, okay, I have pin config output. So maybe it should be in the GPIO output uh, function, but it's not really working. And it kind of confuses people. Um, so output enable as GPIO as output. Uh, many platforms implement this, the uh, output enable function uh, option as a set GPIO to output. So MediaTek does this, I fixed it. Uh, MLogic does this, Qualcomm does this. Um, Qualcomm also implements input enable as the, um, as disable output and is actually um, in violation of the definitions, but they have legacy device trees that they need to support. And so this is even documented in the driver. Um, the Qualcomm PMIX also mapped the GPIO operations to pin config settings. So there's kind of different ways you can implement the interaction between these two um, subsystems. And it's kind of easy to get wrong or get confused. And also some drivers implement input enable as the inverse of output enable, um, which basically means that when you, you can't really set input enable and output enable on the same pin because they cancel out each other. And whatever option the driver parsed last was, will be the uh, option that is actually working. Um, that includes the micro semi ocelot pin controller, the uh, CY8C95X0 expanders and uh, when they expanders. Um, so pin config readback is something that us developers can use to read back the state of a certain pin. It's supposed to read the actual hardware state and convert it into the standard pin config options. Um, some drivers get it wrong. Um, in, like for the MediaTek case, they, the setting of the options and the readback of the options is not the same. So um, for an example, they have this, when you set input uh, enabled, it, it sets an actual input enable bit in the hardware, but when you read it back, it just checks the GPIO direction, which is completely different. And so the readback may actually report bogus data so you're looking at this output and you're, you're wondering like, okay, what, the, what, what, what is the actual hardware state? Is it correct or am I looking at something wrong? And because of these um, incorrectly implemented options, some use case, uh, some options specified in device tree actually have no actual usage. Um, so on MediaTek, there is no actual output enable option. They just implement it as GPIO directions. However, in this case, um, they actually set the pin to a UART function, which is not GPIO. And so the output enable actually does nothing because it's setting the GPIO direction without muxing in the GPIO function. So my suggestions for the community is to properly implement strict mode in drivers that guarantees in, uh, interlocking between GPIO usage and pin control usage. So you don't have cases where you request a GPIO pin and that kind of overrides whatever peripherals that were using that pin. And also implement uh, pin config options correctly. Um, we should maybe try to define them a bit um, better than the current definitions in the drivers um, so that we don't have pin config output or input enable and 
kind of configuring GPIO directions or doing some other weird stuff. Um, and for the strict mode thing, um, currently there are device trees that actually use pin control to mux in GPIOs, and we should have some way to make that compatible with strict mode. And that's it for today. Any questions? I know this is a, like a quick talk because it's only 20 minutes. Any questions? Um, so the question was, the documentation needs to be improved. Do I or do I know any people that have time to do that? Um, so I haven't talked to the maintainers yet. I was hoping to do that um, here. Um, I'll talk to Bartos later. Um, yeah, I might get to around to doing it because I already like corrected some things for the MediaTek drivers. And um, also the Broadcom, the Raspberry Pi driver was getting, uh, was implementing pin config uh, read back and I kind of corrected it. So I guess I could do all the documentation better, but I still, I would need to like clarify some stuff with the maintainers. Um, for the Qualcomm, um, the PMIC or the SOC? Oh, so the SOC driver actually has like a five line comment saying why it's implemented that way. And because it's there to support legacy device trees, I don't think there's a way around that unless you drop support for that. Yeah, so I think that's something you'll have to live with. I don't think I heard anything. I, I added that comment. So. Oh, really? I'm happy to talk to you about it later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I guess we'll solve that here. Any more questions? Uh, uh, just a sort of a comment is, I know some of this stuff is, is extra confusing, partially because different hardware supports different things, right? So I think some of the documentation is inherently ambiguous, uh, and, and by definition, because it says, hey, it really depends on what your hardware can do. We can't really tell you how to do this. But maybe we can make some of it better, because there's still ambiguity even there. Yeah, so the summary is that because the, the driver cores have to support all kinds of hardware, so it's intentionally left ambiguous, and maybe we could clear some of that up, but there's a limitation to how much we can do. Okay, looks like no more questions. If not, then enjoy the coffee break. <laughs>